Well, tonight we're going to continue our discussion of the emotional IQ of Jesus. And we're going to talk a bit about his family dynamics. I want to start by telling you a bit about my family dynamics. When I was in elementary school, we lived in Wisconsin. I grew up in small town Wisconsin. My grandparents lived in California. And so every two or three years, we would load up the family car and we would drive from Wisconsin to California. I had uh, two brothers and a sister. So when I was, I don't know, seven, eight years old, I remember we, we made a long trip out there. We'd stay in motels, but it was a long trip. I didn't like driving in the car. My father did most of the driving. And so the day that we arrived, it was a big day. My grandparents lived in an apartment on the second floor. We went up to greet them. And so it was this happy reunion. Now, my grandmother was fairly controlling. And so all I recall is that she dialed the phone and held it up to my father and said, here, talk to your cousin. Now, my father had just driven 2,000 miles. He had two weeks vacation. This was his vacation. And he hadn't even had a chance to go to the bathroom. And his mother was already telling him what to do. He took the phone, slammed it down, and we stormed out. We left and stayed in a motel for a good part of the week until I think the day or the day before we were to go back and then we saw them. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit for us because we hear a story like that. I don't really know what to do with it. But let's just look at it a little bit because we're talking about emotions and emotional IQ. We want to be intelligent about how we look at situations. So at first glance, you would say, okay, my grandmother was controlling. It was a big part of that culture, and potentially is still a part of our culture, that children are simply an extension of the parent. That the parents believe that kids are just an extension of them. They are there to carry out their will. The reason they believe that is because that was the way things were in their family. And so they're expecting uh, this is what's going to happen. Well, that ability to consider anyone as an extension of yourself, today we would probably call it narcissism. It's something that we assume that other people are going to do what we, we think or we believe and if they don't, there's going to be a penalty. Now, my father probably could have handled things differently. Let's just take a, a look at what you might have done in that situation. You walk in, you're tired, and somebody starts to order you around. Well... If you don't know the person well, you would sort of shrug your shoulders and, and scrunch your eyes and say, what, who, who do you think you are? But if it's your mother, pretty good chance that that has happened before, for many, many years. And so we would call it what's called a trigger. So my father was clearly triggered at that moment. And when you're triggered, you don't really respond rationally. It was very irrational that we had spent five days driving to California only to leave and stay in a motel. Absolutely irrational. But neither my father or my grandmother had the skills, the emotional resources to deal with the situation. My father had what I would call a dismissive attachment style and 
I'm not going to go too deeply into attachment styles tonight, but you may want to uh, look at some of that and research attachment styles. Typically, you get a dismissive attachment style, like I'm leaving and I don't need you. That attitude you get because at some point in your life, you had needs in your childhood. And you went to your parent with your needs, and your parents did not meet those needs. You were vulnerable to them, you exposed your heart to them, you had a need, but there was no response. You were either rejected, perhaps even shamed, maybe you were made fun of for having a need. And so in males, we might think that that would be a weakness. And so the way to deal with that is to say, I don't need you, I'm leaving. So the thing about these attachment styles, especially the insecure ones, is that there's really no discussion. That people do these things because it intends to hurt the person. I'm going to get you back for hurting me. Essentially, it's revenge. But it's, but it's also a form of, of cowardice. You, you don't ever face the problem. You don't ever go to them and say, what you did, that was dysfunctional. That wasn't helpful for me after driving five days to be with you. It didn't help me bond to you, enjoy the reunion. I'd be glad to call my cousin once I've had a rest, but I really want to have a rest. Some of the things that we learned last week was that when we get stressed, and my father was clearly triggered and clearly stressed, we get stressed often because we don't have any more emotional resources. We're tired. We're fatigued. In this case, you know, driving a long way, sitting for many days. This is your vacation and now you're, you're driving and you're being treated in a way that you perceive is disrespectful. A few breaths might have been helpful for my dad. If you can slow down your breathing And as we mentioned last week, it's very difficult to change your emotions either positively or negatively unless you change your breathing. You can think about a baby before they start to cry. Something startles them and they get this, they start doing what we call the glottic hold. They start holding their breath, increasing the chemicals in their system, increasing the circulating stress chemicals until Wah! out comes this incredible shriek or cry and then what happens they hold their breath again we all do the same thing maybe without the shrieks and cries but typically you are changing your breathing I know that before my father stormed out and we all went with him his breathing changed there was a moment of happiness then there was this startle with this phone in his face and this command from his mother Suddenly his breathing changed and he was triggered perhaps back as a child being what he felt was disrespected. You know, one of the ways that we can help ourselves before we get into these situations is that we can actually, in many cases, anticipate them. Could my father have anticipated something like this would happen with his mother? Probably yes. It happened virtually every single time they had gotten together, pretty much guaranteed that at some point this was going to happen. He probably didn't think it was in the first few minutes. So he was blindsided, caught caught by surprise, but as intelligent people who who want to be emotionally aware 
before you go home for the holidays, before you spend time with that difficult friend, parent, um, child, whoever it is, oftentimes you need to prepare yourself spiritually. You know, putting on your armor, I would say. Because the flaming arrows of the evil one are coming at you, and oftentimes they're coming through our loved ones, the people who are closest to us, have the greatest ability to hurt us, to make us feel small, to make us feel rejected. Oftentimes, before I go into a situation like that, I will begin forgiving them before I get there. (laughs) I call that putting up my shield. I'm going to forgive them even before I get there because what? I... I know it's coming, and so do you. This is not news. This is life. That we go to people's houses, and we're pretty sure that at some point in this particular environment, someone is going to offend us about the way we look, about something that we've done in the past, something that we've posted. There's some offense coming. We just don't know exactly where or from who, but... It takes time. Any of the things in the spiritual life often take time to practice that you need to think about, okay, I'm going to pray about this now before I get there. If you've got someone to pray with you, maybe maybe wise, even do some journaling. Father, is there anything that I need to know before I get there? Let's review the last time we were together. Let's assume that they really haven't changed at all because I think most of us somehow, for some reason, believe that since we saw them last time, they've changed a great deal. It's going to be different this time. Where does that come from? We are optimists. You know, what did we kids learn from that? What did we kids learn from that experience? Not only that one, but all of my father's interactions with his parents. As much as my dad would say, oh, we want to have a close family, I want to have a close family, what he modeled with his parents was not a close family. And what we had was not a close family. Because what you get with your children is not what you tell them, it's what you do. We had a period of time, one of my brothers wasn't speaking to the rest of us for for five years. Where Where did he learn that? That dismissive attachment style, I don't need anyone in the family. Very painful for the rest of us. You know, people often ask me, what, what can I do? My kids don't really you know, respect me. They don't pay much attention to me. My first question, how do you treat your parents? How do you respect your parents when you speak about them, when you talk about them, when you visit them? It's so ironic that we all expect and anticipate that our kids are going to treat us in a different fashion than we treat our parents. And we've got good reasons. Justifiably, our parents were much worse than we are. (laughs) They're watching us. And And so is the public. I want to talk now, I want to share a story of the life of Jesus. And when I talk about these events in Jesus' life, I just want to encourage you to get the scriptures and read them. And as you read them, look, fill in the details. There are so many details that are missing that would make a difference in the story. What was the tone of voice? What was the backstory? What was happening in their lives at this time? Maybe even what was their attachment style? I want to read the story of Jesus at 12 years old going with his parents to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. 
So Jerusalem was about a two-day journey from Nazareth, where they lived, about 60 miles. In Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. In other words, they had been going every year. And when the feast had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. And then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his, mother, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. You know, usually when I read that story, it's one of those that you kind of read quickly because it doesn't sink in so, so deeply. But I want to unpack a little bit of it tonight as if we were there. You know, typically I read that story and I see, wow, okay, mother lost her child, comes back. And then we get this strange answer like Jesus is from another planet speaking to his distressed mother. Um, You know, why were you looking for me? You know, did you not know I would be in my father's house? Sort of an alien answer like, are you? And so you just turn the page and go on, I don't get this. Uh, But let's take a look. So some people think that actually this was Jesus' bar mitzvah. He was 12 years old, 12, 13 was the time of bar mitzvah for a Jewish male. So this might have been uh, something, at least the year of his bar mitzvah. But I want to look at at Mary first. What was she telling Jesus? She's actually talking about her, why are you, why did you cause us to suffer? Why have you treated us so? She's actually accusing him of treating them poorly. Well, what did she suffer? Well, how many have been lost at the fair or a supermarket or lost a child or you've been lost? How many? Yeah, most all of us have had. It's one of the most terrifying experiences that you go through. There's, there are a few feelings of being so out of control than when you lose your child, or you are lost. It it is, I don't know many things that come close to that. It's it's a certain kind of terror. So if a mother loses her child, whose fault is that? It's hers, right? And she's asking for him among her friends and relatives. You don't know where your son is probably even a little bit embarrassing. Oh, and then you've got to go back. How many like to go back? I don't even like to go back when I forgot something I just pulled out of the driveway. If you have gone a day's journey on foot, maybe there was a donkey involved, I I don't know, but a whole day, they didn't have 7-Elevens in those days. Travel was difficult. And then there's the three days of wondering, well, where is he? Did he try to follow us alone to Nazareth? I mean, Jesus tells a parable some years later about the Good Samaritan. Oh, it was dangerous traveling alone, especially to a place like Nazareth. As we learn from Nathaniel, can any good thing come from Nazareth? It was the Las Vegas of the day. 
She was concerned. She was concerned. I'm not even sure she slept those two nights, the night that she found she couldn't find her son and then the, on the trip back. Probably very, very tired, weary from her journey, weary from her anxiety. You know, there's also the bit about, was Joseph losing wages? He was unable to work while they're making this trip back. Oh, there was a cost to this family coming back. We read in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 54, when Jesus goes to Nazareth, and they reject him there, some interesting things are said. They said, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? I don't know how many sisters he had, but it's certainly possible that Mary and Joseph had another six kids. Where were they? Who was taking care of them? This mother had a lot going on. I think many of us can relate to that. We have a lot going on. And so she comes. But before we look at the interaction, let's look at the situation from Jesus' point of view. As far as we know, he, he, this was the first time he'd been separated from his parents and the first time his parents had been separated from him. Probably no small amount of, of anxiety there or concern. He comes back from the temple that evening and the campsite is empty. Everyone's gone. What was he feeling? He's 12, so he's not driving. He's got no cell phone. Presumably, he also doesn't have any money. So there is some di- there's a dynamic going on. His mother probably also knows he doesn't have any money. So he can't actually buy food. We're wondering maybe where he was sleeping. We know that there were some people that stayed in the temple. By name, there was a woman named Anna who stayed all day and all night in the temple fasting and praying. So there were people that stayed there day and night. It's very possible that he stayed and slept in the temple. But we don't know. So these words, why were you looking for me? I mean, is he, is he out of touch? He's in some sort of fantasy world. He doesn't understand why. Like, I, weren't, I, wasn't, I wasn't concerned at all. Why were you looking for me? It's obvious that he missed the departure of the Nazareth caravan. And it's also obvious that his parents expected him to be there. But we know that Jesus never sinned. In fact, he tells people, you know, to show him if he's ever committed a sin. So we know that he was a sinless man, the sinless son of God. So I don't believe that if he was told that he was supposed to meet them somewhere, that he deliberately disobeyed them. So now we have a scenario, either he was told and he forgot, or he wasn't told. Maybe the other kids were told. Maybe he was expected to know, but he wasn't told. If there were other kids in the family, maybe he was, they were assuming the parents that they told some of them everyone would know, but maybe he was in the temple and he didn't hear them. Was this his first time at the temple? Is that this time when his parents left, it was just that day, was the very first experience he, he decided to go to the temple? I don't think so. I mean, this was probably all Jesus ever talked about, was spiritual life, was God, was things. And the temple was the center of spiritual worship. It would be like a kid who was a baseball fan, you know, every time he comes to San Diego, he wants to go to the Padres Stadium. That's where you're going to find him because that is who he is. 
This has been so very apparent since he was a child, and I believe he's telling his mother in a very kind, sensitive way, reminding his mother, in other words, why were you looking? Looking means you don't know where I would be. Don't you know? Don't you know me? Mom, don't you know this is all I ever talk about? This is who I am from my very core. This is who, all, who, I've, who I've always been. Every time I come to Jerusalem, this is where I go. This is the only thing that lights me up. Didn't you know? And maybe in the busyness of life and other responsibilities, she had forgotten Oh, the virgin birth, that's right, the, the shepherds came, the wise men came. This is a special child. Uh, because know what? no matter what supernaturally has happened to you, you've been healed, you've had some miraculous thing occur in your life, some beautiful thing, you've just gotten married, whatever it is, life continues, and it's It's hard. And it's arduous, and it draws your attention from those important, beautiful, special things. I think he was saying, Mom, Dad, when I'm in Jerusalem, I'm not at the mall. I'm not playing stickball. I'm always at the temple. Now, the temple in those days was sort of like a mall. And Jesus would address that later in his ministry. I believe Jesus was starving for people to talk to him about God. It's interesting that the, the people there in Jerusalem had a special interest in his questions and his answers. But we don't get that report from the synagogue in Nazareth. That was a small town situation. It sounds like they were actually not interested in talking about the things that he was. They didn't ask him questions. You know, it says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. See, she comes at him, I believe, with a very real response. The response likely I would have had after three days and two probably sleepless nights, worrying about about your son. And what we do is we then make other people responsible for our problems, for our issues. Son, why have you done this to us? Now, I do that too. In the operating room, it's never the surgeon's fault. It's always the nurse's fault, the anesthesiologist's fault. It's never our fault. Very convenient to blame other people. Jesus doesn't actually receive the shame. He doesn't receive this. He just points out very, I think, very sensitively, as God so often does, he he just asks the question, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Oh, by the way, my father is not Joseph, remember? (laughs) You see, there are a lot of things veiled in there. A lot of things veiled in there. Oh, that's right, his father's not Joseph. And his mother treasured these things in her heart. He speaks to her heart. You know, when you... When you inconvenience someone, how do you respond to that? What is your response when you inconvenience a parent or a family member? Fear? Terror? Many of us are people pleasers. I am among them. And when I inconvenience people, often I I get very afraid. Oh no, I wonder what they're thinking. And many of us that are people pleasers are that way because there was a time in your life when it was actually dangerous to inconvenience 
an adult. It was dangerous to inconvenience an adult. You learned to please people because it was important for your survival, your emotional health, possibly your physical health. I want to talk also about overwhelm. Overwhelm is one of those things that often happens when there is too much energy in a situation. And it appears here, it appears to me, my read on this is that Mary was overwhelmed. Understandably so. Jesus does not appear to be overwhelmed. I think he was probably, this was actually a great training for him. Some years later, he was gonna, going to go out to the wilderness alone for 40 days. And he need, needed to know that he was going to be able to rely on his father. He was going to be able to find food and a place to sleep. In that case, he was, he was fasting when he went out for, uh, for 40 days. But he was going to need to be without the attachment of his parents at some point. And I believe God was already, the Father was working things into his life that allowed him to train. How are you going to respond to this test? How, when you panic, what are you going to do? And the episodes that are in your life right now are tests. I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is, of course, God is, is with you and that you are going to learn through this test. And the bad news or the sort of bad news is you're going to be tested again. So you're going to want to learn it this time. There's going to be another test coming. That is what we know about life. There's always another test coming. We want to make it so that we can lock in our gains and build a white picket fence around our house and we don't have to mature anymore. Well, I've got news for you. You never stop maturing. You never stop having to trust God. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den when he was, I calculated this, 80 years old. 80 years old. I'm thinking, and I even prayed. I said, God, why would you throw an 80-year-old man into the lion's den? He's done enough. Isn't, I mean, give him a break. Let him go out in peace. And you know what I heard from God? He said, but you're still talking about it, aren't you? You're still talking about Daniel today. What are you going to be doing when you're 80? What faith test are you going to go through now that's going to be retested and retested? And you're going to keep passing those. Or you're going to come around again. God has a remedial plan. We get to take the test again. <laughs> oh, this looks a lot like that last one. I remember when, when Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. The first time, he's got them in the boat. And there's a storm, but he's what? He's sleeping. So he's there, but he's not necessarily there and they are panicking a bit of an illustration of how absolutely exhausted Jesus was I used to think it was some imaginary thing that he was sleeping in the boat he's probably pretending to be asleep he says at one point the power is I felt the power go out of me when he heals someone he's doing but he's doing that thousands of times tremendously drained and also at peace. So the disciples, he, he sort of gets up, he rebukes them. Where was your faith? Interesting, not long later, the disciples find themselves in a boat again. And would you know there's a storm? Jesus is not with them at all this time. He's expecting them to have learned the lesson to have taken it in. Oh, last time he, he calmed the storm. There's something that we can do about this now. We don't have to just sit here and wish we were somewhere else. And then Jesus comes to them walking on the water. 
your lessons, your tests will be used again. So enjoy the journey. <clears throat> Overwhelm. When we're overwhelmed, we often do things to overwhelm others. What we know from research is that when you're overwhelmed, you don't take in information very well. In fact, you're barely able to take it in at all. So let's just talk, so we make sure we're all understanding what overwhelm is. Let's just define it a bit and, and how it might look. What are some signs that the person you're talking to is overwhelmed? Maybe an open glance, maybe a ha ah, ha, one of those laughs, ha <laughs> ha, one of those, uh, uh, maybe some tears, maybe a gaze aversion. Ever talking to somebody and they can't look at you, they're just looking away? Uh, kind of nervous twitches, tapping their finger. It's important that you understand signs of overwhelm in yourself and also in other people so that you will know when the other person is overwhelmed, especially if you have a spouse. You're going to want to know when they're overwhelmed. And why do I say this? It's very, very common that a man is overwhelmed, typically. He's come home, he's had a long day, there's been a lot going on, and the wife wants to give him some information. And he starts averting gaze, he starts maybe reading the paper, and she takes that as a sign that he's ignoring her. And so she does what is logical to her, and she turns up the volume. If she speaks louder, it's going to help. It's going to make him hear her. I've got news for you. When you are overwhelmed, you, you really can't receive information well. You see ch parents do this with children, right? They grab them by the arms and shake them. Listen to me, listen to me. And the child is just looking off. They, they, they can't receive the information. But the problem with overwhelm is that we feel a desperate need to give the information. I have got to get this off my chest, and I've got to get it off my chest right now. And so we've got to dump the truck. When you dump the truck emotionally on someone who's overwhelmed, it says to them very powerfully, I don't really care about you. I care about me. This is about me. I don't, I'm not noticing what's happening with you. I'm not noticing. Uh, I'm not sensitive to your feelings. I have got to get this off my chest. And you are going to listen to me and respond appropriately. So when you overwhelm someone, especially a child or a mate potentially, you get a behavioral response but you also sow the seeds of distrust. You sow the seeds that I can no longer trust you to be sensitive to my heart, to read my heart, to read my signals and my emotions. You are not a safe person for me. But you may get an okay, I'm listening, or yes, mom, yes, dad. But what the person believes now is that I can't trust you. Because relationships are based on trust and respect. And so you start breaking that down as you start moving through overwhelm cues. Now, it does not appear at all that Jesus was, was overwhelmed. And I believe that his kind and direct questions to his mother were able to actually get her under control and remember what a beautiful relationship they had. I just want to pause right now. It's important to pause at these things. I say these things, they're quite heavy. And I want you to just think for a moment of, is there someone that I overwhelm? 
Or is there someone who continually overwhelms me? And I have never actually told them, look, I can't discuss that right now. I will discuss that with you. Let's make an appointment. But right now is not a good time. Do you have that presence of mind? Many of us need to, to practice our, our breathing even, because when someone overwhelms us, there is a fear response that comes. And you feel the need to defend yourself or to, to speak or to say something or to accuse them. They say when we get hysterical, then we get historical. We start bringing up things from the past and we start accusing them of what, yeah, but you do this. I'm just going to give you a moment. I just, it's just important, I think, let the Lord speak to you right now. I'm just going to give you a 30 seconds or a minute. The last thing I want to talk to you about is control in relationships. And even more than control, I want to talk about manipulation. Most of us grew up in families where we were manipulated. And we have grown to believe that it's actually necessary in relationships to manipulate other people to get what we want. <clears throat> when Jesus' mother comes to him, it appears to me that she's actually trying to, to make him feel guilty. She's trying to, to make him sorrowful for causing this problem to her. That may or may not have been the case, but that's the way I, I read it. Uh, that's, that was my experience. We always read the, the scriptures through the, the lens of what we went through, and so that is the way it appears to me. Jesus says something very powerful about trying to manipulate people by trying to use words to get people to do what you want. He says it in Matthew chapter 5. It has to do with uh, these, the, the culture of the day, which was, taking, which was swearing. You would swear an oath that this was true because the more you would swear about something, the higher the chance that someone would believe you and would go along with whatever you were swearing to, probably in a business deal or something like that. And Jesus says this, Again, you have heard it said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Anything more than this is evil. It is very common in our society, and I want you to think about in your life, the pressure that you put on other people to do what you want them to do. How you make them feel. Do you use guilt? Do you use threats? Do you use pressure? If you don't do this for me, there, is, there are going to be consequences. Part of that is there are consequences to poor decisions, and children need to know that. But as we get involved in pressuring people to do what we want, I think that we cross a very bad line. We cross a line into manipulation. Manipulation is very, very common in our culture. It's common... If you can just think about it in your life, people do it regularly. And I can look at my own life, and I have been guilty of doing it on many, many occasions. But control, I believe, is a form of witchcraft, and I don't say that lightly. It is, it is basically trying to get people to do your will, and it's not really trusting God that his will is going to work out. Most of us pray about it, and then we pick up the phone and start calling people to get done what we want. Or we text them. Or we, we try to get our plan 
whether it's a business plan, whether it's a relationship plan, we try to get whatever it is that we want done. And what Jesus is saying here is that any kind of pressure that you're going to put on anyone else by words that you use, it can be threats, it can be seduction. Very common manipulative tool today. Wearing an outfit, doing things that, that allure someone to you. Using promises, using oaths. And then there's that, with that manipulation that my dad uses, that withdrawal, that pout, slam the door, I'm gone. That'll teach you. Yeah. Yeah, it will. It will teach us things, and it will teach us how not to have good conversations with each other. It teaches us to also use manipulation and not talk to each other. You know, I've learned to call people and say, can you help me? No obligation. If you're busy, it's okay. Because it's up to God how my plan goes forward. I have stopped trying to make people feel guilty. Look, you're the only one available. You're the only one with a truck. You're the only one... Whatever it is that you need, we, we so commonly catch ourselves, I need you for this. Are you trusting your father? Because if you stop manipulating, your relationship with him is automatically going to grow. It has to. Because you're giving up your personal control. Let me tell you, surgeons love control. We love to control. We want to control all the variables. We want our reputation to stay high. We want to control our relationships, our finances. We want everything under control. This is a big deal. I'm speaking from experience. I often tell people, if I sense that my request, just because of who I am, is going to land on them as a pressure, I, I specifically say, no obligation. I have other options. I want this, my life to go forward. I want God to bless it on his terms. I'm just going to give you a, just a minute to think about that in your life, and then we're going to have Hannah come up and, and, uh, and play some more for us. Let me just give you a minute just to think about that. Is manipulation and control, guilt, shame, seduction, promises, pouting? Is it, how are you, how, what has been done to you and what, are you doing to others? I want us to be honest with ourselves tonight and perhaps even with someone when we go home. Because we all do this and God wants to help us with it because he wants to partner with us to be our partner to make those things happen and further the relationship. I'm going to give you a 30 seconds or a minute of silence now. <laughs> 